Welcome to the Strategy Sherpa Show, a series of organic discussions between host David Chavez and a variety of notable business leaders centered around their most significant failures and how they handled those challenges so listeners can learn from their most teachable moments and apply the lessons to their organizations. Now, here's your host, David Chavez. Hey, everyone. This is David Chavez. This is the Strategy Sherpa Show. And boy, do I have a great guest today. Uh, Young Ho Cheng is here from the D.C. area joining us. And Young Ho, good morning. Good morning, David. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, no, it's great to have you here. I, I mean, I, th I think you're going to share some really interesting stuff with everyone today. So I'm really excited about you being around. Um, let me just talk about a few things that Assured Strategy is doing first. Uh, this Wednesday, I am actually doing a webinar uh, at 1 p.m. Central Time on the financial forecasting and planning. And what I'm going to be really focusing on is how to do the revenue buildup on financial forecasts, because I think a lot of people just uh, say, hey, we're going to grow by 10%. And it magically, that's like the magic number they want when they have no, um, they're not using analytics to really understand how much they could grow, because maybe they could grow 20%. Um, maybe they could grow, maybe they don't, it shouldn't grow 20%. They should grow 5%. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to do a webinar on the 8th of August. Preston Law is going to be doing a webinar on uh, cash also and scaling up your cash reserves. And what he's going to be talking about is how processes really impact cash flow, um, inefficient processes, delays, things like that, that really end up beating your cash reserves up. And then on the 22nd of August, we're going to be unlocking the psychology of accountability and smart goals with my partner, Kane Pekvic. And um, in on the 17th of September, we're going to be doing a scaling up workshop in Denver, Colorado. Ted Servada and I will be doing that together. And um, please uh, join us. We I think we have over half of it already sold. So we'll probably sell out on that probably in the next few weeks is my guess. And um, but let's go back over to Young Ho and talk a little bit. Um, so, Young Ho, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I mean, I'll fill in some because I have quite a bit of information on you, too. But tell us a little bit about your background. Um, so where did you go to college? Yeah, so I went to Virginia Tech uh, okay. and got my civil engineering degree there. And then I did my graduate uh, work at University of Virginia. So big rivals, but, you know, two great in-state in schools. Well, so which hat do you wear during the games? That's the real important question. Yeah, I think you always go for your uh, undergrad alma mater, right? So I'm a Hokie, but when uh, when Hokies are not playing, I'm a Wahoo. So yeah, all good. <laughs> okay, so you have two different hats that you wear at different times, but if if the two teams are playing, you're a Hokie. Yeah, all right. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't say that too out loud. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people would understand that, actually. All right. So that's great. Um, and then after after college, so you're a civil engineer. And then what did you do after college? Uh, tell us a little bit about your early part of your career. Sure. Um, so graduate from college, and uh, that was 1987. So the economy was just hot. There were so many uh, jobs and openings and so forth. Uh, but I interned with the Virginia Department of Transportation during college, and I really enjoyed that work. So I uh, started my career with VDOT full time. And uh, I, I really loved that opportunity to work for the public sector. And the interesting thing is I interviewed with private firms and they said, oh, yeah, go to VDOT, as they were known, and do their in, in the training program. After three years, come and work for public sector or private sector, because that's what the real thing is happening, right? Because government, you know, that's for people who can't get the private sector job. That's not true. <laughs> not always, no. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And then after after you went there, what did you do? Because you ended up at ATCS, right? Uh, at some point. Yeah, yeah. It was an interesting journey. So after 11 years with VDOT, you know, I had to kind of make a decision. That was probably my first big decision 
And that kind of set me up for, you know, other uh, big decisions later in, in the, uh, my career. And that was really, you know, I, I love my job at VDA, a number of different opportunities. I mean, I, at age of 29, I was, uh, uh, you know, responsible for 400 people and $300 million budget. I mean, you, you can't get that kind of responsibility anywhere. Yet, you know, they trusted me with a lot of different things uh, with VDA. But I had to make a decision. Is this going to be my career where I retire after 30 years? And am I going to look back at my career and say, have I really challenged myself and did other things? And I, I had to answer that question in a way that like I wanted to try different things. I wanted to challenge myself in other areas. So uh, I went to ATCS as a company I'm with now, but I only lasted a year and a half. And I'm going to share kind of the background because that gets into the, the failure story. Yeah, and then I, yeah, I left after a year and a half and I became director of transportation for Fairfax County, which is in Northern Virginia. And I love that job. Man, I, I, you know, I was a highway guy, highway engineer, but I learned about uh, all the different modes like transit, bus service, pedestrian movement, land use. And I was even a registered lobbyist for the county. Oh, and, wow. I, you know, I advocated for funding for transportation for the county at the both state and federal level. So that's, I mean, you don't get the kind of experience as an engineer being a lobbyist. So that was really good experience. And then I went back to ATCS and I've been with ATCS ever since. So there's a lot more to, to get into, but I'll, I'll save that for a little bit later. Oh, that's great. And then, and then so um, your cycle went all around and then you um, went back to, to, to your company now and you were the COO for quite a while, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I left ATCS because uh, I, I really didn't like the culture at that time, the first time I was there. And, you know, I started the transportation practice, which is pretty much what we do now. It's a dominant part of our business. And we were very successful right off the, the gate. Um, very lucky. Uh, and... Um, However, I really didn't like the culture of the firm and how we treated our employees and so forth. And I left, David, a year and a half. I mean, I, I said, I just, you know, I didn't feel good, at, uh, you know, going to work every day and trying to hire people into a company that I just didn't feel like it was the right fit for me, you know? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so as an engineer, um, we're, we are, you know, I'm a, I'm an accountant by trade. You're an engineer by trade. Our brains are are focused on numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And and so your 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 company became very focused on numbers. Right. Yeah. 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 It was uh, very focused on numbers. Are uh, very focused on financials being successful. And we were very successful financially. I mean, we won jobs and we were very profitable. And so it was. You know, uh, I think everyone outside looking in would say, "Hey, that's a successful company." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, let uh, we'll come back to that because um, there's a little bit of your your story in that um, because you know at this on, on the Strategy Sherpa Show, what we talk about is things that we really messed up in our careers, right? Um, <laughs> a decision we made or something we did that we messed up, and we're not doing that to rub your nose in it or anything. Thing, but what we're doing is we're sharing as leaders that part of our learning is making mistakes and then fit, having to fix those mistakes. And that creates a whole nother level of challenge, right, for us. And then um, and then bringing it back to share it with people, not yeah. so 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 they can sort of understand that mistakes are part of the game, but also to understand how they would go about fixing some of the things after. Because sometimes we make those mistakes with greatest intentions, our yes. intentions are pure and good at the time, but we don't know that they're a mistake. But I want to talk a little bit about where we we met, um, because um, you know every once in a while I, I I'm I'm a speaker for Vistage. I'm a member of Vistage also. I'm a, uh, also a member of EO. But um, I I as a, a member of Vistage, I also speak for Vistage quite a bit. And I got an opportunity to meet you when I uh, got invited to speak by your chair, um, Jane Scott. 
and um, she's in the Washington area or the Northern Virginia area, and she has um, Vistage groups there. And tell us a little bit about her and what your experience has been being in her group, because I think it's um, something that people should share. Yeah, so I joined Vistage uh, about four years ago. And, you know, when you become a CEO, you're kind of inundated with different people saying, oh, you should be part of this group or you should pay a lot of money and, and, and for your leadership development, which is all kind of interesting. And I, I sat through some of the sales pitch and, I, you know, it just didn't sit right with me. So uh, I said no to all of them. But about four years ago, and it's all intertwined with the story that I'm going to share later, um, uh, I, talking with Jane Scott, sat through the first meeting, you know, being somewhat of a spe uh, skeptic, and I went through topic processing or issue processing, right? What a great thing. And I had this tough issue that I was uh, grappling with and the group really helped me. And, you know, having other CEOs, a dozen other CEOs helping to address your issue is really remarkable. And Jane Scott Cantus, I mean, she does a great job leading the group. And we're pretty candid, you know, about, uh, she's pretty candid with me. She like confronts the things that I'm doing that, and really uh, takes me to task and think through what's going on and and why I'm doing certain things. So it's a it's a great group to be able to share thoughts that you really can't within your own organization, right? Right. Yeah. And, and I, you know, because I speak a lot of Vistage groups, I meet a lot of Vistage chairs, which the chair is the head of the group gotcha. that really runs the group. And I would tell you that she was probably one of the best that I that I've spoke uh, had the opportunity to speak with and I was just really in admiration one of the things I really loved about her and and you could talk about this a little bit is that she was very challenging to everybody not not in a negative way but trying to challenge you to think a little bit differently and as a CEO both of us understand that that's one of the things we absolutely need right that is so important David right because um you know, within your organization, there's not going to be that many people that challenge you. You know, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's not always a bad thing. But at the same time, if you're very compliant, you're never really going to vet ideas, right? You're just going to follow the CEO's lead. And, uh, you know, he may be taking you down the wrong path. And, and I'll show you the failure of one path that we took, right? Yeah. But yeah, Jane Scott, and, and she's very good about receiving um uh, you know, information from us. Uh, funny story. I think one of our first, second uh, coaching session, one-to-one -one coaching session, we went through and at the end of the, the session, we were kind of walking out and I said, oh, James, Scott, is this it? Is this, is this it for coaching? And she was, I think she was stunned, first of all, but she came back later and said, you know what? You challenged me to be even better coach. So that's our little inside joke. Like, is this it? Yeah. <laughs> Challenging each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, our firm is a coaching firm and, um, you know, we like it when our clients challenge us. It's a little hard to hear sometimes because just like anybody, we get a little, we feel a little defensive, right? When people are challenging us. But if you really think about it, those challenges take us to the next level in our game all the way around. So I love how you're talking about it. And I think it's really important for people to get that. If you don't get it from a Vistage group, get it from an EO group or get it from even um, working with us. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah. We go into companies and help them even talk about their company. Um, I think in the group setting, it's a little bit different in the sense that we're all helping each other. And we also learn from helping other people too, right? And because so, there's always unique challenges that we haven't experienced yet that somebody else is experiencing. So there's a lot of benefit in all that. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you found found quite a bit of benefit, but you know, uh, because we are a live radio show, there comes a time when we have to take a break, and this is about that time. And um, but I'm just really excited that you're here. I love I I love that you um are on, with Jane Scott and her groups in Virginia. And if somebody wants to get a hold of Jane Scott in Virginia, please just let uh, let me know, and I'll connect you with her and. She, I'm sure she has a few openings in her group and would love to talk to you about that. 
But um, well, let's come back and talk about the issue because you started brushing on it a little bit when we were talking about you leaving um, ATCS uh, in the past. So let's come back and do that. Well, this is the Strategy Sherpa Show. We have Young Ho Cheng here with um, ATCS out of Northern Virginia. And we'll be right back after this messages. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the Strategy Sherpa Show with David Chavez. Have a question for David or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show. All right, we're back and we have uh, Young Ho Chang with ATCS out of Northern Virginia. And um, I was really hoping, Young Ho, when you were talking earlier, that you would actually share a little bit about ATCS. Yeah. So um, maybe before we get into the the issue, can you tell us a little bit about what it does? Because then it sort of frames it up in the people's mind a little bit. Better. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So ATCS, we're an infrastructure engineering consulting firm, and we're headquartered in Northern Virginia. Uh, with 10 offices uh, from Pennsylvania all the way down to South Carolina. And we have over 270 employees. We're celebrating our 30th year in business. Right and uh, we do all kinds of transportation engineering, planning, design, construction management. We also do emergency management services and site civil land development engineering. So uh, we're really proud of the company and the work that we do. So, so, so you are helping um, basically any type of transportation issue any company has, any government has. You're the company that they call when uh, in those areas to help them plan these things out and design solutions to problems that they have. Is that is that's that exactly how? yeah, mostly for the public sector clients, uh, mm -hmm. for state DOTs, and you know that kind of helps with my background and so forth. But yeah, we uh, design, we do everything in terms of highways and uh, transit systems and bridges and roadways and all those things. Yeah, uh, that's very cool. Um, probably exciting work. I, I mean, especially as a civil engineer, you you want a variety of work, right? Um, so you can learn more and you guys probably get quite a big variety having that such a, ge a large geographic area you're covering. Yeah, and, and we built a little bit of niche on uh, what they call mega projects, projects that are billion dollars or more. And oh, nice. we just kind of figured out how to really get those projects uh, working and together and to get it done. And a lot of the what they call the P3 project, public-private partnership with outside private sector money combined with public infrastructure and making it into a uh, more or less like a toll road, express yeah. planes, et cetera. So we've done quite a bit of uh, that kind of work and uh, been pretty successful at it. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting, exciting stuff. And especially when you start to uh, see the benefits of it too, is helping traffic flows and things like that. I'm sure it's um, very rewarding. Um, let's, but let's get into it. Um, uh, I like to get into it in the second section. So um, you join the show. And when I, when you join the show, I tell you that I want you to talk about something that you made a mistake on. And so um all of us have made these mistakes and especially sitting in the top chair, even sitting in the lower chairs, you do the same thing. You're you're trying to make decisions with the information you have and you're always trying to make the best decision. I don't think anybody says, oh, let me make this decision just wrong. But um, but but share with us what happened for, with you. So you you were sharing a little bit how you left ATCS at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. So this all kind of ties in. Uh, I became CEO of ATCS in 2015 after 10 years as executive vice president. And like I said, that was my second stint with ATCS. Back in 1998, I joined ATCS, started the transportation practice, pretty good uh, success, a uh, number of project wins right out of the gate. However, after a year and a half, I said, you know, I, I, I can't be here anymore. And that's <clears throat> really because my unease and I thought misalignment with the culture of the firm. We were very focused on the financials and we were a very financially driven firm. Like we counted everything. And 
and it was a, a very much of a priority to be financially successful, which is not a bad thing, but it was overemphasized in my opinion at the cost of employees and, and development and so forth. So I said, I'm done with it. <laughs> Good luck, ATCS. And I went back to the public sector. But, you know, somehow the founder, after six years, you know, he called me up and said, we need to get together and talk. And, and I didn't really give him the full scoop when I left, but I felt emboldened. I said, hey, listen, the reason I left was culture stunk here. <laughs> you know, I didn't like it, you know, and he was not deterred by that. He challenged me, actually, and he said, well, why don't you come here and do something about it? Well, I didn't expect him to say that. You know, yeah, so I, I took that challenge and I went back to ATCS and uh, we've been working on the culture. So um, kind of getting to uh, the, the question of failure. And I love that premise about the show, David. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? um, so when I became CEO, there was a lot of pent up desire and demand for a cultural shift. Right. So. We uh, and we were stagnating. We were doing financially well, but we weren't really growing. It was hard to attract talent, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so in pursuit of the cultural shift, you know, we said, what is our purpose statement? What is the why of the organization? Right. You start with that. Right. And we said we exist to enable our clients, employees and communities to flourish. That's our purpose. And along with the purpose we establish what we call our four pillars, okay? And four pillars are client, employee, company, and community. And I would describe our four pillars as kind of like all these things wrapped up, like our values, expectations, and, and the behaviors that we expect all rolled up together. So everything is great, right? Like we got, this is the kind of stuff that you need to do. And it took some time, some years to socialize within the company, but people were attracted to the purpose and the four pillars and the culture of like family-like company that values employees, you know, employee first and profit and everything else will naturally follow. You don't have to think about it because when you emphasize and focus on employees, everything works together. And I bought into that. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> so and then we got recognized as top workplace and and yeah, I, I just want to I, I want to talk about that because you like even this year you have USA Today's top workplaces yeah you have ACE EC which is American um um what Consulting is it Engineering. Council of Engineering Companies yeah Virginia and then you also won um excellence award with um um wts probably yeah, yeah yeah exactly you have all kinds of and, and then you also won another top um culture award with the atlantic chapter of pro, pro apwa so you uh, not you don't have one or two awards <laughs> you won this year you've won a lot of culture awards so so your company is a little off on its culture and you want to bring that culture into the company because you understand the importance of the profit, which you're on board with that importance. But at the same time, you want to reemphasize people because the, the firm has maybe not focused on that as much as it should have. That, that's exactly right. That's, that's a good, great summary. And, you know, it, it was working, right? And these things were kind of like... Uh, uh, you know, God posts along that journey, as we call it. And we saw revenue and profitability increase in 2018 and 2019. We were like in the top 5% of engineering firms. So we were like, hey, this is a secret sauce, right? And everything made sense that we were the right kind of company that valued employees and clients and community and all that. And I, I will say, um, and I espouse that all over the place. Like, that's the secret, folks. This is how you do it. Yeah. And then COVID hit, right? But I would say this, even before COVID, our fundamentals were showing signs of weakness. So, and I would say our foundation were built on sandy soil. Okay. Okay. And it started end of 2019 and the first quarter of 2020 before COVID. 
Now, COVID, just like many things else, it just accelerated a lot of things that's going on, right? And it happened with us as well. So we started seeing the de uh, decline in our revenue and profitability. And I think, not I think, I know somewhere along the line of our culture shift, we lost focus on business performance. Because we said, hey, look at all the things we're doing for employees, the benefits and all those great things. And everyone's happy and so forth. And we said, oh, yeah, oh, business performance? Oh, yeah, it'll just kind of take care of itself. Well, they didn't really take care of themselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially COVID, because that really impacted uh, ATCS in, in a negative way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love how you're saying this. Um, so so you're going along. Uh, um, so, so let's go back to the beginning. So you go to work for this firm after you've been working 10 years uh, for the government. You come into the firm and about a year and a half later, it's so uneasy to you, the culture that you end up leaving and go to work for Fairfax, right? right. And, and, and and I'm sure that was a very disappointing moment for you when you had to make that decision to leave because you invested a lot in coming over there. And go for, go for it. You had something to say. Yeah. And yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, my compensation doubled when I went to the private sector from government, and <laughs> uh, you know, I was offered equity ownership. Uh -huh. You know, uh, near the beginning of my tenure because we were doing so well. So giving those things up because of the culture wasn't right was something I really had to think about. Um, but it really set in motion how important culture is to an organization, at least my personally, and it aligned with what I thought it was important the way we need to run an organization. Yeah. And I love how you didn't compromise yourself because I think a lot of us, um, like when we're not, we, we don't think about this with this clarity that we really should, that these small decisions end up making huge impacts on our lives. And, and if you would have made that decision differently, the impact on your life could have been much different, right? Your happiness, things like that. It was funny when I was in the army, um, I had this major who helped me um, with the, some of my English classes. And one of the things he taught me was, and I still remember this quote today, he goes, David, it's not the big decisions that impact your life. It's the small ones that impact mm. it even more. And it seemed like, I know these seem like a big decision, but the small decision was, I'm not going to stay here if I can't ha work in a place that the culture is 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 valued, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so we're a radio show. And it's that time again when we have to take a break. I knew these breaks just come by and they, it all comes by so quickly. But I want you to come back so we understand that the culture wasn't right. I want to. I want you to share with us what you did after you, when you come back. So we're going to take a break. This is the Strategy Sherpa Show. We're here with Young Ho Chang with ATCS. And we're uh, talking a little bit about a decision he made and how he approached something that didn't work out exactly the way he wanted it to. So we'll be right back after this message. Is. This is the Strategy Sherpa Show. Thank you. Welcome back to the Strategy Sherpa Show with David Chavez. Have a question for David or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show. All right. This is David Chavez. This is the Strategy Sherpa Show. We're back with Young Ho Cheng with ATCS out of Northern Virginia. And um, we were talking right before the break, and you now have the 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 realm. You're mm -hmm. holding the reins uh, 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 of the organization, and you want to fix this culture problem. So, what did you start doing? Yeah, so we, you know, really talked about how uh, you know the purpose statement and the four pillars, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. really emphasize the the culture of family and caring. Uh, culture and people really love that. Uh, somewhere along the line, we kind of lost the focus on business performance, and and that pendulum swung to like 
the caring side, the compliance side, getting along is more important than, you know, really debating over strategy and decisions, right? And somewhere along the line, like the profit and so forth became a little bit of a dirty word. Like we're, we're, we're bigger than that. We're beyond that. And we even allow mediocre performance to continue so that we can preserve our family culture. So people weren't hurt by that. And we also made excuses about circumstances and environment that was affecting our performance. Like, oh, that's why we're not doing well because of other things that are happening. And we really didn't do a great job of holding people accountable. Right. So, so, so um, in scaling up, we have two things. We have the people and we, we say that you have to develop KPIs for the people side to make sure you're paying attention to the people. Right. Um, and then you have to have KPIs for the process side, which is profitability, managing efficiency, things like that, that, uh, and it's like a teeter totter. You're, right. you're trying to balance these two things all the time. You don't want to weight it one too much to the people side or too much to the process side. And it sounds like what happened was you are weighted too far to the process side. Then you swung the pendulum to the other side and weighted too much to the people side where you guys lost focus on what's important in a business profit, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. And, and as I mentioned that we thought it would naturally follow that, but it really doesn't happen that way you know well it's so, it, it, uh, so what i say is it does follow it naturally as long as you pay attention to the kpis right um and, and because you guys lost and you even said it you lost focus to accountability to the kpis yes. like some of these kpis we have to hit these kpis because if we don't hit these we can have the best culture in the world but we're all gonna not work together anymore because there's no money left. Yeah, yeah. You have to measure. You have to uh, allow people to succeed, and if and and also be accountable for the results as well, right? So, yeah. um, some of the things that we did was really uh, allow a lot more transparency in the organization, especially on our financial performance. We started sharing everything, you know. So, like, here's here's where we are with our benchmark metrics. Here's how we are doing with our like peer companies. And I think people were surprised, like, what? What do you mean we're just a mediocre company when it comes to financial performance? I think that was a kind of an awakening. And we had to really continue to work on this message so that the pendulum doesn't swing to the other side, like where we used to be, right? Yeah. So there's that fine line there. And and we heard from some employees like, hey, are we emphasizing profit over family culture? You know, is that is that what we're doing? And so there was training involved and discussion. And we talked about productivity and utilization because we work billable hours. That's how we generate revenue and profitability and how each person contributes to that financial success. So there was a lot of like grounds up education and discussion about what this means and setting targets and holding people responsible and having alignment within the organization was so important. And one of the things that we did a couple of years ago was to set a 10 year vision for the company with three focus areas, keeping our culture the same. We wanna continue with our great culture of caring and family and being preeminent in what we do and being a top tier financial and growth and performance. So we had these three areas. We said, we wanna do all these things. And we subscribed to the idea of the genius of the end. Remember Genius of the End by Jim Collins, right? Most definitely. I, 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 those are the, I, if you've ever listened to this show, I, I talk about Jim Collins is my favorite strategy author, right? Yeah. That was a, a light bulb. When I read the book, as well as hear him speak and so forth, taking seemingly contradictory concepts or ideas and integrate them into a coherent uh, whole to uh, you know generate superior results, right? I think that's yeah. how we define it. And it's like, that's what we were trying to do. It's not a trying to do a balance of caring and performance it's doing both well right right not right. having to choose one or the other 
And uh, the other thing, David, is just like we said right off the bat, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be yeah. hard, <laughs> right? And so yeah. we all need to we all need to be in on it. And because we want to be a firm that cares about employees, clients, and community, and promote lifelong learning, and be financially successful. Like, wow, I'm going to do all three, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, if people don't know what the genius of the end is, it's 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 like like um um young ho just said it's it's contradictory things that you want both of them at the same time and there's going to be tension between the two things as you're doing it and that's some of the employees coming to you and saying hey we're not going to be a family centric company anymore you're like Oh, hell no. We are going to be a, a family centric company. We're not changing that. But we can't just be a family centric company and not make money. We have to do both of these things. And you guys did, ended up doing three. And what were they again? Can you share? So, us with yeah, they're um, caring, learning and performing is how we're kind of describing our cultural driver. Caring, learning and performing. So we care about employees. We care about our clients. We are a lifelong learning company and we perform at the highest level. Like I just love, I love those three things and how you're using them too. Yeah. That And that's great. And I think it's really import important in a professional organization, because if you don't learn and keep yourself on the edge, you can die very quickly. Um, within a few years, you could start to lose your competitive edge because you have to be out the, uh, on the forefront of all the technology, of all the latest developments, things like that. So I know that's constant tension inside of these companies. Um, I, it was a constant tension in my company, too, as a CPA that we had to keep on learning all the time. So so what ended up happening? Like you're trying to balance this off and, and you talked a little bit about it, but I just want to label it. Um, there was a little bit of fear in people when you started talking about profit, right? Again, um, how did you make the decision to share everything? Because I, I think those are really hard decisions because you all, I, I, we also have all these weird thoughts, like somebody's going to take the information and use it incorrectly and all these things that we conjure up in our minds. How, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I, I think those are all uh, appropriate things that you're going to be debating about, you know. So, uh, I mean, I want to be clear, we don't share all the numbers in our books, right? But at an appropriate level, we share uh, top-end numbers or uh, we call them balance, which is profit uh, before bonus and tax and all that. So we just, it's a different word, balance, and uh, it's a, it's kind of the vernacular that we came up with. So um, I'm not sure if we get it perfectly. But I will say this, that there is a, that sweet spot where people know that they are contributing to the financial success of the company by being like meeting my goal. So if you are an entry level engineers and you have two projects you're working on, they know what they need to do in addition to caring about the clients and employees and doing lifelong learning that I need to do these types of performing to be able to contribute to that financial success. Like I need to be at a certain percent billable percentage, you know, per week, because that meets the goal of the performance metric. Right. Does that make right. sense? I mean, it's yeah, not, yeah, no, 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 it think. makes, it, it yeah. makes total sense because, but, but so, so um, people are a little resistant to that right at first. How did you get through that resistance? How did you approach that? when people started to panic a little bit that you were going too far off in the deep end, you started sharing information. You guys had to decide what information you were going to share. What else did you encounter? Because I, there's a lot of fear in that, right? Because when you have a really good culture and then they start talking about profit a lot, there's a little bit of a fear that creeps in. How did yeah. you deal with all that through just training and helping people? What did it's you do? Yeah. Uh, so what we found is it wasn't really the staff. It was really the middle managers that we had to convince 
that this is the way to go. And that took a lot of different things. One is just being transparent and again, have an open forum where you can discuss these things. Like, hey, I'm concerned that if we do this and push too hard, that we're really gonna lose our identity. And we would say, why would you think that? Let's talk that through to really, you know, is that you know, evidence-based fear or is this something that we're just kind of conjuring up because we're really not sure what's in the future, right? So a lot of that discussion, a lot of discussion about like, how do you measure performance and why is that important? How does that link to the profit? You know, so, even you would think it's pretty straightforward, but it's not. It really isn't. And what does that mean? You know, why are we striving to meet certain goals? Well, here's a benchmark. <laughs> you know, here's what uh, the average firm will do. We need to be better than average, right? Because we want to be preeminent. So those things all come together and it doesn't happen. David, just like culture shift at the beginning, it took three, four years. I think we're getting there. And I can tell you 2024 is going to be our best year ever. <laughs> well, I, I can see it's probably shaping up to be that. Uh, all the awards you guys are winning and you don't win awards just for having a great culture. You still have to be a profitable company. So I see those two two things happening now. And Young Ho, I cannot tell you how important what you just said in the last few moments are to some of the people out there that are dealing with this change and have to make it inside of their company, it's one conversation at a time, right? And it's slowing things down a little bit and having those conversations, even though it may torture you a little bit to have them, because it's like, I've already said these things several times and I got to talk about it again, but it sounds like you did those things yeah. and it took the path uh, uh, that there was resistance for you and but it paid off big for you and it's really starting to pay off now. Don't forget your frontline managers. That's correct. They yeah. hold the key. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the, and and you and I we were actually talking about that when I was at your Vistage group that day and I loved how you guys talked about it. Well, listen, our time is up. Uh, I, I but but I want to tell you I so appreciate you coming today because you've shared some really valuable insights with people and I don't think this is a topic that anybody has actually talked about in the year, a little over a year that we've been doing the show. So I think this is going to be a really valuable show for people. And I will use it with, with people to say, hey, go watch a show because Young Ho really talks about this in a way that's a very sincere. And just getting to know you a little bit and talking to you a little bit, I know how sincere and how much you are, uh, how much you value the culture. And it's so refreshing to see that you're balancing these two things out the best that you can. I'm sure you'll they'll get a little unbalanced as you're going along, but you'll tweak them quickly. So yeah. well, thank any, you. Close, any closing words to the audience? No, I mean, this is a journey. And, yeah. you know, we make mistakes, but, you know, it's like failure and success, same side of the coin. They're not opposite side of the coin. It's the same side. <laughs> I, I love that you just said that because it feels like it's not, but it is. Right. So uh, thank you very much for being here today. This is the Strategy Sherpa Show. We're going to take a break and I'll be right back after the after this break and summarize the show for you. Thank you, Young Ho. We appreciate your time today. Thank you, David. Enjoyed it. Take care. Bye bye. Welcome back to the Strategy Sherpa Show with David Chavez. Have a question for David or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show. Hey everyone, this is David Chavez. I am back, and we just finished up with Young Ho Chang um, with ATCS out of Northern Virginia. And um, out of Northern Virginia, but all the way from Pennsylvania to, to South Carolina, I think he said. Um, so either North or South Carolina. I think it's South Carolina. And and um, what a special guest. I mean, we've had a lot of people on this show talk about a lot of different things, but I don't ever think I've had somebody talk about the culture, shifting the culture. You're working for a company that doesn't value its people and it, you just sort of feel that. And um, he decided that he was going to leave 
And then the owner calls him back about five years later. He wants to just tell the owner why he really left because he didn't tell him when he left the first time. And he ends up sharing with them why he really left. And then the guy challenges them to come and fix it. And, um, it, you know, you know, you, you have all these decision points in your life of what you're going to do with your life. And he ends up going there and starts to work on the shift. He becomes the operations officer and the ex an executive vice president with the company. And 10 years later, he's handed the CEO reins and now it's his, you know, now he has to take take it take it he ends up fixing the culture to the extreme you know he swung the pendulum too far to the other side and that's pretty normal when we're fixing things sometimes we over fix them and um that was costly too and then he had to bring it back to the center and when he's bringing it back to the center he he started getting some resistance in his company not because the people didn't um not because the people didn't care. It's because they cared, they resisted. It's because they're working in a place that they love to work at and they didn't want to lose the culture, but neither did he. He wanted to keep the culture, but he also wanted to have the company be profitable so that people could make the money that they needed to make to support their families well. And this is when he applied the genius of the end out of the Good to Great book. And in the Good to Great book, book Jim Collins talks about this and what he really says is embracing both extremes on a number of dimensions at the same time so the extreme of extreme focus on people and loving your people loving the families of the people making sure we're taking care of them but at the same time being a profitable company that's beating the industry standards and is also very successful in its own right of what they define success at. And so it's these tensions that are going on between these two, the genius of the end. I want a great culture and I want to make money. And at the same time, these two things always don't match up and come together. And that's the genius of the end is managing these two things um, like freedom and responsibility. The more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have. And, and these things don't equal out together because responsibility means you have to get things done. Freedom means that I can do whatever I want to do. And so you have these two tensions that are going on. And if you think about these tensions, we need these tensions inside of our company because a lot of times with companies, the profit becomes the objective instead of actually what the business is trying to do and having fun reaching the profit. And I think that that's what... Um, um, Youngo really talked about is that we wanted to keep the culture in a great place where we all were excited to work there still, and at the same time, accomplish amazing things and be very profitable. And so I love that. I loved his sharing there. I don't think that I could have said all these things better myself. And it, it was his thing that he ran into. Um, we're on this journey of profitability, I also would like you to think about valuation. And, you know, if you go over to our website, um, there's a resource tab up at the top and you can click on the resource tab and we give away a few free things. And one of the things is a free valuation. And that's also on the homepage. There's a button for the free valuation. But if, um, you know, understanding where your business is at, being a valuation guy myself for several years, I had found that most people never really looked at their valuation. They always thought they were going to sell their business from for some X dollars. And I, I, I think that that, that, that belief, um, it, because somebody tells them that their business is worth 5X of whatever, their EBITDA, their revenue or whatever, they believe that that's the number. Well, those are those are rough averages. And if you have an average business, you should sell it for that amount. If you really want to sell your business for the, the, the amount you should get, you should track your valuations every year and make sure your valuation is staying up there. And so this gives you an opportunity to do that. I think it's really an important number that executive teams should look at at least once a year. And they probably should be sharing it through their middle leaders 
so that everybody understands where the business is at. And especially if you're starting to share some of the profits and things like that. So um, you can get your free valuation. We also have a free disc profile, a coaching session, and us coming to a meeting and just evaluating what's going on inside of your meetings if your meetings aren't working correctly. All those things we offer for free over on our website. And sometimes with the meetings, we'll actually come to your location if you guys physically have meetings in your location. Last one we offer is a gap analysis of what your current state of your processes are versus what is actually being done. A lot of times companies will have their processes documented and then what is actually being done is different. And we can come in and look at it and tell you what those gaps are where people aren't following them. And um, that's a great resource for you too. So um, Young Ho, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're gone already, but I'm just saying thank you because I know you'll probably end up listening to the show to see what happened. Uh, um, I want to uh, I want to tell everyone about the um, the scaling up events that we have. We have a scaling up workshop in Denver on September 17th. That's a live workshop all day long. Um, these are introductory workshops. We're going to do some more advanced ones next year, but these are introductory workshops. So we're going to be in Denver on the 17th of September, and then we're going over to Fort Lauderdale. So we'll be on the other side of the country on October 15th. So if you're in those cold states when it's starting to get cold, come down and join us um, and learn about scaling up. Um, we're going to be sharing the fundamentals of scaling up and how to get it started into your company. And then on December the 10th, we'll be in San Antonio, Texas, just right down the street from where I am in Austin. And um, we look forward to having you at some of our events and uh, take away the lesson today. When you're making a change, you have to take your time and have all those hard conversations, change in people's mind. People do not like change as much as you think they do. They'll tell you they like it, but they really don't. And you have to spend time having those conversations. I think Young Ho just summarized that really well. And it's just been an honor getting to meet him because he's handled it so well. This is Strategy Sherpa Show. We'll be back next week. Have a great week. Thank you very much.